Hey guys, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In November 1997, the Nists from Trenton, New Jersey, were gearing up for their annual cruise tradition, a practice they had cherished since their wedding six years prior. Julie, 29, and her husband Tim, 40, decided to switch things up this year, celebrating Christmas during their voyage. Their main goal was to strengthen their bond, so they left their one-year-old daughter, Katie, with grandparents and headed to San Juan, Puerto Rico, on November 1st to board their cruise ship. George Skiadopoulos, a crew member, was immediately struck by Julie's vibrant and attractive presence. Teased by a colleague that she was out of his league, George wagered he could romantically engage with Julie. Although just a junior engineer, 22-year-old George, freshly out of college, carried himself with enough poise to intrigue Julie. He misrepresented himself as the captain, exaggerating his age to 28 and fabricating achievements to impress her. Julie and George quickly grew close, meeting daily on deck, engaging in captivating conversations. Julie, swept up in the cruise's romantic ambience and George's charismatic tales, didn't realize his true identity. Tim, accustomed to his wife's sociable nature, observed their interactions but felt no jealousy. One evening, amid a lively party on the ship, George invited Julie for a tour of the ship. Initially hesitant, she eventually agreed. In the deserted engine room, a spark ignited between them, culminating in a kiss. However, their relationship did not progress beyond kissing for the duration of the cruise. Back home, Julie confided her feelings to a family friend, Tony, expecting her attraction to fade since she and George would likely never meet again. Unexpectedly, George, the captain, sent Julie a message. Their daily phone conversation soon followed, with George insinuating that Tim wasn't worthy of her. Tim occasionally caught them talking, but trusted Julie enough not to probe further. Torn between her stable family life and the thrilling new emotions George stirred in her, Julie became distant from friends and even cold to her daughter. Concerned, Tim noticed the changes in her. Hoping to rekindle their connection, Tim planned a surprise 30th birthday party for Julie on January 3rd, 1998. It was a lavish affair attended by many friends. Julie's request for another cruise on a specific ship and date was her ploy to reunite with George. Reluctantly, Tim agreed, and they embarked on February 13th. On that voyage, during a dark night, George won the bet he had made with his crewmates. Julie's intimate encounter with George during the cruise left her head over heels. Back home, she excitedly confided in Tony, a close family friend and godfather to her daughter, Katie. Tony struggled with the burden of keeping her secret, later admitting this to Julie. Despite the risk of exposure, Julie decided to secretly meet George, for whom she yearned intensely. She concocted a family vacation pretext, bringing along her mother and daughter. Julie had to confess her secret affair to her mother, facing her disapproval, but she was undeterred. Initially, they went to Florida, but on March 26, 1988, Julie left her mother and daughter behind to continue her romantic escapade with George in Puerto Rico. Upon returning, Julie's communication with George became almost public. They talked incessantly on the phone and exchanged risky love letters via email. Julie even recorded videos showcasing her life for George, all under her husband Tim's nose, with whom she continued to live and spend his money. She also resumed partying and drinking. Tim couldn't help but notice the changes in their family dynamics and suggested seeing a marriage counselor after seven years of marriage. During their first session, Julie announced her desire for a divorce, which Tim opposed due to their shared business interests that were generating significant income. Julie knew she needed finances for her plan to move to Greece with her daughter and start a new life with her lover, who was due to serve a compulsory 20-month military service in Greece. Julie attempted to help him flee and secure a U.S. visa, but she lacked sufficient funds. For her new boyfriend, Julie began a fitness regimen, experiencing sleep issues and resorting to strong sleeping pills. Amid emotional turmoil, she also started taking antidepressants. George learning about this, was furious and forbade her from using them. Julie lost about 10 kilograms, aiming to return to modeling to earn money, but George, unlike Tim, was intensely jealous and did not support this idea. 
forcing Julie to abandon her plans. Almost everyone, including Cheryl, who once helped Julie enter the modeling industry, disapproved of her relationship with the Greek man. They had witnessed the evolution of Julie and Tim's life since they first met at an exclusive yacht club party in July 1989. Tim, 11 years her senior, was a successful businessman with his own company and a new yacht. He had established his landscape design company in the early 80s, flourishing alongside the U.S. real estate market boom. Initially, their relationship thrived, but Julie's jealousy was evident. Once, Tim waited for her at a bar with another woman, and upon Julie's arrival, she assaulted Tim, leaving a bruise on his face, and attacked the woman. It turned out she was the secretary of a man Tim had worked with for years, merely assisting in business matters. The conflict was resolved at that time. Tim was taken aback one day when he arrived at his office to find Julie sitting at his secretary's desk. With her charming smile, she announced that the former employee would no longer be working there, effectively usurping her boyfriend's job and leaving him little choice but to accept her as his new assistant. This allowed her to work from home, granting her more freedom, including financially. Julie had always dreamt of being a model. One day she spotted a beauty contest advertisement in a newspaper and decided to participate, confident she would win and supported by her loving partner, Tim. They compiled Julie's best photos and sent them to the magazine organizing the contest. However, it turned out to be a scam by the publishers to obtain free photos for their men's section at the back of the magazine. Julie eagerly awaited a response from the publishers about the contest, but it never came. Determined, she visited the magazine office and confronted the editor about her prize. He accepted her photos and promised to feature them in the next issue. Julie shared this story with everyone, preparing for the competition. The event took place at an elite hotel with 12 finalists, including Julie. Despite her efforts, only one judge voted for her. However, this experience helped her befriend the magazine editor, Cheryl, leading to Julie becoming the magazine's face and appearing on billboards across the city. As her fame grew, Julie began receiving modeling offers, becoming a local celebrity until the autumn of 1990. She still worked for Tim and won some smaller beauty contests, but struggled on the larger stage. On November 16th, 1991, Julie, then 23, and Tim decided to get married. The couple led an active life, not restricting themselves in any way. By 1997, Julie's modeling career was growing, increasing her income. She began appearing on TV, but unfortunately, started abusing alcohol. Their marriage had its ups and downs, but they generally maintained a mutual understanding and love. Tim wanted children, and they were financially stable enough to provide for a child, but Julie was hesitant, not wanting to risk her modeling career. However, in February 1995, Julie became pregnant. Her friends said she continued to drink and smoke throughout her pregnancy. On November 26, 1996, the Nist family welcomed a daughter. Katie Scarlett. Becoming a mother profoundly changed Julie. She embraced her new role. During this time, her mother, Julia, actively helped with Katie's upbringing, though they often disagreed on parenting approaches. Julie soon experienced postpartum depression, partly due to the significant changes in her figure after pregnancy. She withdrew into herself, not attempting to return to her previous condition. Around this time, her relationship with Tim began to deteriorate. By April 1997, they sought family therapy. Julie felt the therapist sided with Tim, but the specialist genuinely tried to address her issues and complexes, uncovering unpleasant aspects of her past. Eventually, the therapist stated that Tim wasn't giving his wife enough attention, leading their marriage to the brink of collapse. Feeling lonely, Julie started socializing with friends more and often came home intoxicated. During this tumultuous time, Tim, following the family therapist's advice, decided to take Julie on a cruise, hoping it would rekindle the warmth and passion in their relationship. However, his hopes were dashed as Julie's newfound passion for another man continued to erode their family life and her own well-being. Due to her secret affair, Julie's mental state worsened. 
One day, Tim was unable to access important business documents because Julie wouldn't let him into her room. The situation escalated to the point where he had to call the police, and despite Julie's active resistance, Tim retrieved what he needed. Julie developed paranoid thoughts, believing Tim had hired a private detective to follow her. The household atmosphere grew tense, and it became clear that divorce was inevitable. In midsummer, George and Julie met in the States and secretly got engaged. Julie didn't hide her plans to move to Greece, but intended to do so the following year. Around this time, Tim discovered international phone bills totaling six, seven thousand dollars per month. He finally realized his wife was having an affair with the cruise ship engineer and had been communicating with him behind his back. Furious, Tim decided to divorce Julie, eager to sever all ties with her. In response, Julie tried to restrict Tim's access to their daughter, aiming for full custody to freely move to another country, but Tim resisted. As the couple tried to sort out their issues, Julie's new lover George announced he had quit his job and was coming to visit her in New Jersey. The continuous arguments and conflicts with Tim stressed Julie to the point of hair loss, but she believed it was due to being apart from George. She also became jealous of George's interactions with other women and demanded constant contact with him. When George arrived in New Jersey, their relationship spiraled into chaos. He constantly inquired about money and persuaded her to spend more, forcing Julie to ask Tim for funds, further limiting her interaction with her daughter, which greatly irritated Tim. George frequently lied about his financial status, and it was surprising how unremarkable he appeared, making Julie's infatuation with him even more bizarre. Friends and family strongly advised Julie against the relationship, unable to comprehend how she fell for a balding, unemployed, hopeless man with bad teeth, who was also manipulative and extremely jealous. Nonetheless, Julie was smitten. She even planned to use her divorce settlement to finance George's hair transplant and dental work. When Tim learned of all this, he was furious that Julie was involving their daughter in the situation. He threatened that if she tried to leave, he would take Katie and Julie would never see her daughter again. This threat seemed to somewhat cool Julie's ardor. She even told friends that her relationship with George had ended, but it didn't last long. Within weeks, she went to Greece with George to test their relationship. They met his parents, and Julie was thrilled with the weekend, hiding her marital status, daughter's existence, and modeling career due to George's parents' religious beliefs. Back home, Julie dreamed of finalizing her divorce and starting a new life with George. On December 6th, she received the divorce decree and was ready to leave the home she shared with Tim. She left Katie and checked into a hotel where she used large amounts of drugs. On December 8th, Julie traveled to Greece to get married and start a new life with George. George quickly convinced her to open a joint bank account, citing his lack of knowledge of the Greek language. Blinded by love, Julie deposited $80,000 into the account, giving George another $18,000 in cash for additional expenses. All her money. After that, she disappeared without a trace. On January 8th, George called a friend of Julie's to inform him that Julie had disappeared. He said they were supposed to meet outside a McDonald's for a meal, but Julie never showed up and he waited for hours. With no cell phones, he was unable to contact her and reported her missing to police. A short time later, Julie called the same friend and told him about her longing for Kathy and problems with her fiancé. The friend assumed that Julie was planning to leave George and return soon, but Julie never returned to the U.S., and George's call raised serious concerns. He claimed that Julie had disappeared without her passport, allegedly left in her car, and then taken away by the police. However, he could find no witnesses to confirm that the police had taken the passport. It all sounded very dubious, so the friend turned to Tim, the only one who could help. Tim immediately realized that his ex-wife was in serious trouble. She had last contacted relatives in the U.S. on January 7th. There had been no word from her since then, adding to the fears. The police began combing the neighborhood, interviewing possible witnesses, but Julie had no acquaintances in the new place, so they questioned her relatives in New Jersey and looked into her background. Julie Scully, daughter of Julia and John Scully, was born on January 3, 1968. She developed a very close relationship with her father, willing to do anything for his approval. Father and daughter spent much time together, often going fishing. However, 
On November 10, 1969, Julie's younger brother, John Patrick Scully, was born, drawing all the parental affection, leaving Julie feeling neglected. Julie's mother hailed from a Native American reservation in New Mexico, one of the largest tribes in the United States. Life there was challenging with no electricity or running water, high unemployment, and rampant alcoholism and drug abuse. This led Julie's parents to send her to a boarding school at age 12, hoping to provide her with a better life through English education. Upon reaching adulthood, Julia moved to the city, attempting to adapt to mainstream American life. While working at a psychiatric facility, she became entangled in the world of drugs. During this time, she met a police officer named John in 1964. Their romance blossomed quickly, and they married on July 2, 1965, just two days before their anniversary. John later became a patrol officer in one of North Philadelphia's most dangerous neighborhoods. Julia fell pregnant and gave birth to a daughter. John lovingly cared for his daughter, often leaving Julia feeling isolated from the family life. She kept her drug addiction a secret, though her erratic and unpredictable behavior occasionally surfaced. Her situation worsened as she delved into more dangerous drugs. Meanwhile, feeling constantly tired and unable to quit without experiencing severe withdrawal symptoms, Julia soon fell pregnant again, and a younger son joined the family. Already depleted, Julia Scully found it challenging to care for him. In 1973, during a bout of depression, she overdosed on sleeping pills. John found her in time and called for medical help, saving her life. This incident brought her problem to light within the family, complicating matters further. Once a beautiful Native American woman, she now resembled a shadow of her former self. Another suicide attempt followed, but again, she was saved. The turmoil within her parents' relationship didn't go unnoticed by the elder daughter, who was nine years old at the time. On Julie's birthday, her father abruptly left, leaving behind his wife and guests. He was having an affair and sought escape from Julia's addiction, which repulsed him. He stayed only for the sake of their children. His mistress arrived to pick him up, and both Julia and their daughter saw them as they followed John out. John's blatant disregard for the secrecy of his affair deeply hurt both his daughter and wife. Julie blamed herself for her family's troubles, unable to understand the situation's true nature. Julie, who had always been an excellent student, started facing academic troubles. She became popular among her peers and fell into a bad crowd. Her attendance and performance at school declined. Seeing this, her father decided to transfer her to a new school in Kensington. At 12, Julie's attractiveness garnered a lot of attention from boys. The Scully family lived in a troubled neighborhood, heightening her parents' concerns about her future and the risk of falling into substance abuse like her mother. One evening, when Julie's friends were supposed to sleep over, she disappeared from her room with them. When her mother discovered their absence, she panicked and called the police, who found the children in downtown Philadelphia. Julie's relationship with her mother worsened, leading to regular conflicts and scandals. Her rebellious spirit also manifested towards her father, despite their close bond. As a police officer, he always knew where and with whom his daughter spent her time. Seeing his wife's failure in raising their children, he took custody of them while sending Julia to rehab for drug addiction. The family environment became calmer during her absence. Despite Julie's efforts to please her father, her rebellious spirit grew as she matured. She continued spending time with friends, leading to skipped classes and poor grades. Her father, infuriated upon learning this, was dismayed, especially since Julie was only 14. The close and warm relationship they once shared seemed to have vanished. Julie expressed her desire to drop out of school, possibly a cry for attention that she had started seeking on the streets. Her beauty made her the center of attention at every party. In 1982, Julie graduated from high school. Her parents hoped for her to pursue specialized education, so her father, a police officer, helped her get into an engineering college. He appealed to the college director for special admission conditions, emphasizing Julie's Native American heritage. His efforts paid off, and Julie was admitted to the college in the fall of 1983. She had already been leading sexual life in her 18. Julie's brother chose a different path. Despite similar upbringings, he enlisted in the Navy at 16, 
Around the same time, Julie decided to leave college to seek financial independence. She soon met Neil Ziegler, who was six years her senior. Their relationship quickly blossomed, and they secretly married in November 1985, just a few months before Julia's 18th birthday. Her father, initially unaware of her marriage, later supported it, believing it was better for her than staying with her dependent mother. However, the marriage ended in divorce in 1988. Julie returned to live with her mother, finding a new job but reluctant to contribute to living expenses. Her striking appearance drew attention everywhere, with many mistaking her for a model. Julie gradually began using her beauty to interact with affluent men. Despite outward confidence, she was fragile and desperately sought love, but only found fleeting relationships. It was during one such social gathering that she met her future husband, Tim Nist. After moving out, Julie's mother spent years in therapy and finally overcame her addictions. When Julie and Tim had a daughter, the grandmother eagerly assumed childcare responsibilities, remaining involved even when Julie ran off to Greece with a new lover. After Julie's disappearance became known, her mother described George as truly pitiful. He was unattractive and unpleasant to look at and seemed to have no control over his behavior. The missing woman's mother recounted an incident where she fell victim to George's aggression during an argument with Julie. George shouted and insulted the woman, grabbing her by the throat and pinning her against a wall, not releasing her until he heard threats of police involvement. Julie attempted to end their relationship and called the police after the attack, leading to George's expulsion from the country. Despite this, she soon went to join him in Greece. She actively defended her lover, even taking the blame for the assault. Julie's mother suspected George's involvement in her daughter's disappearance. Following Julie's disappearance, George continued to play the role of an active helper in the search. Julie's close relatives tried to contact the American embassy in Athens, but faced a language barrier as the Greek police stations handling the investigation had no English-speaking staff. The FBI from the USA joined the investigation at this time. It was revealed that George had Julie's passport the entire time. Initially, he claimed to have found it, but changed his story to theft when he learned of the FBI's involvement. His behavior became increasingly suspicious. He attempted to withdraw money from their joint account, but was unable to do so. On January 23, 1999, the couple was supposed to get married. During this time, news about the missing American woman was broadcast on news channels and radio stations. George angrily called Julie's friend, who had approached the media about the case. He claimed his innocence and even made a public statement in the press, actively giving interviews in an attempt to justify himself. However, 16 days after Julie's disappearance, George was brought in for questioning as the main suspect. George recounted that after moving to Greece, Julie quickly became disillusioned with both the country and him. She increasingly missed her homeland and daughter and wanted to return. George tried to support her, but the situation worsened, deeply troubling him. In her final days, she cried constantly. At one point, George's mother found out about Julie's former husband and daughter in America. She began to despise Julie and openly expressed her dislike to George, urging him to leave the woman with a troubled past. The conflicts between the lovers became more frequent and severe, leading to their eviction from a hotel. Julie wanted to contact her family, but her lover prevented her from calling relatives and even physically abused her. The police learned that George's mother suffered from schizophrenia and often stayed in a hospital due to her issues. George inherited some of these problems, he had an inflated self-esteem and always behaved arrogantly. He could manipulate others, which was noticed by the missing woman's relatives and friends. At the slightest disagreement, he aggressively attacked his lover. Besides Julie's mother, who had suffered from his violence, Julie herself sustained serious hand injuries, but claimed they were accidental, continuing to live with her tyrant. After four hours of conversation with the police, George could not stick to the story he had spread in the media and confessed to killing his lover. He claimed it was an accident. Apparently, the lover genuinely regretted what had happened. He even cried during the interrogation. However, his confessions were confusing and full of contradictions. Initially, he claimed Julie had never disappeared, then again admitted his guilt, and then denied his involvement in the incident. On January 8, 1999, 
the couple set off on their long-awaited trip to Athens. They were driving along a deserted two-lane highway, enjoying the tranquility and scenery. A calm conversation gradually escalated into a serious conflict. Finally, George decided to stop on a stretch of road where there was no one around. In a fit of rage, he jumped out of the car and attacked his beloved, choking her as tightly as he could. He wanted her to be silent and stop screaming. George told the police that it seemed as if he was watching all this from the outside and lost control of himself. He couldn't stop himself until Julie stopped showing signs of life. The lover claimed that these horrific moments lasted only a few seconds, but investigators knew that strangulation takes at least three minutes. Afterwards, George was in a state of shock. He came up with the idea of burning his beloved's body, scattering her ashes in the sea from a cliff, and then jumping after her to reunite with her. George recounted that he attempted suicide by shooting himself with a pneumatic gun, jumping under a truck, and taking an overdose of medication, but all his attempts were unsuccessful. However, he was now at the police station for questioning, indicating that all his thoughts were mere fantasy. In reality, he handled his beloved's body differently. After the murder, George simply threw it in the trunk of his car and drove to the nearest gas station. There, he bought gasoline and returned to the crime scene. George dragged the body away from the road near two small lakes, doused it with gasoline, and set it on fire. But due to the rain, the body did not burn completely. At some point, he decided to throw it into the lake, but instead, he stuffed the charred corpse back into the trunk and drove to his grandmother's house. There, he found a large travel bag and decided to pack Julie's body in it. But by this time, it had begun to stiffen, and he could not bend it. Moreover, the head did not fit in the bag, so George decided to simply cut it off. He described how he held her head by the hair and lifted it to his face. He remembered seeing terror in her eyes, but she still remained beautiful. So he kissed her on the lips before packing the body in the bag. Then he burned the bag and threw it into a swamp, leaving the head behind. Later, George drove to Kavala, where he threw Julie Scully's head into the Aegean Sea. Nineteen days after Julie's disappearance, her ex-lover and would-be husband helped detectives find the murder site and the remains. Tim and the victim's family were informed by the police that George had confessed to the crime. The victim's ex-husband went to Greece to bring Julie's body back to her homeland. Meanwhile, the criminal recounted what he had done to the woman in a live broadcast. Learning of his misdeed, the murderer's mother suffered a stroke, and his grandmother was shocked. The Greek authorities stated it was one of the most horrific murders they had known at the time. Tim's father declared that the lover should have died along with his beloved. Despite this, numerous articles emerged blaming the victim herself for what happened. The victim's family believed her lover initially used Julie for money as soon as he heard about her wealthy husband. He persuaded her to divorce and win a large settlement in court, which she was supposed to invest in his business. However, before her death, Julie finally realized his true intentions and refused to fund his projects, leading to her becoming a victim. The trial of George Skiadopoulos began on November 27, 1999. In the Greek justice system, Trials are conducted by three judges simultaneously instead of a jury, significantly speeding up the process. Additionally, there were no defense witnesses present at the hearings. George gave horrific confessions that lasted about five hours. His lawyers tried to argue insanity, citing that the criminal's mother suffered from schizophrenia and he might have inherited mental problems. Meanwhile, the accused himself requested the death penalty, although capital punishment was prohibited in Greece. Eventually, on December 6th, the court unanimously sentenced George Skiadopoulos to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole on all charges. However, the Greek justice system was not perfect. In 2002, George appealed, claiming he was insane at the time of the murder. As a result, his sentence was reduced to 23 years with the right to further appeal. By 2007, the criminal was released and now lives with his new family in Kavala. In the United States, Julie's ex-husband, Tim Nist, became a pillar of support for all her relatives and friends. Despite her betrayal, 
He proved to be a dignified man who took on the responsibility and organization of Julie's funeral. After the funeral, Tim was given a diary of memories about his ex-wife for their daughter Katie. Written by Julie's friends, the entries tried to portray her life from a bright and kind perspective. When her daughter grows up, she should know that her mother loved her and was a wonderful, beloved woman. Love is a complex emotion that can be a beautiful and constructive force. But recklessness can sometimes cloud judgment and lead to dangerous actions. In most cases, people can realize the reality in time and protect themselves. Unfortunately, Julie's circumstances were different. Her story serves as a reminder that safety and well-being should always be priorities in everyone's life, even in matters of love. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel and don't forget to click the bell not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.